my joy, my pleasure, my privilege to introduce Lindsay Jones, Dr. Lindsay Jones. And um, what can I say? Um, well, as far as his credentials, I, many of you probably know of his work. He's a scholar of comparative religion, historian, teaches at the Ohio State University. Um, Lindsay's books, The Hermeneutics of Sacred Architecture, the two volume set originally. Um, soon to be republished as a seven book series. Um, I take personal credit at my University of Minnesota for one of his uh, volumes of this Hermeneutics of Sacred Architecture was in the Art History, the main library. The other one was in Architecture. And I said, can we please at least put these books together? <laughs> so Architecture won. So I didn't have to go back and forth. Um, so it's really fantastic that they're going to be republished as this seven set series. It's really seminal, pioneering, and integrative work. Um, if you haven't read them for many of you had, I really um, get it right on them. So I think we're really lucky to have Lindsay here being a you know a scholar of uh, religious history um, here at our architecture, culture, and spirituality. I was just at a conference where I shouted down for using the word spirituality as a sloppy term in academia. So here we are in kind of this crossover world. Um, but Lindsay's um, he's also well known for bringing the um, work of Mircea Eliada forward through his extensive editing of his, I think, 16 part encyclopedia, bringing that work forward. So Lindsay's a kind of heir to that work, but has really brought it into his own practice, especially through his interest in Mesoamerica. Um, I know you've been working at Oaxaca, Oaxaca, and um, ideas about this, um, you know, this 25-year-old ritual architecture, this idea of, um, you know, ritual architecture and reception, you know, really thinking about the idea of contemplation much more deeply than most architectural historians or religious historians. So um, I really appreciate that. There's somebody who has thought hard about spirituality and contemplation. So he's doing all of those, I think, makes a really great, great service. Um, just a personal note. Um, so, cards, you know, it's like it's a thrill. We live in Minnesota, we don't have cards. Um, also, it's a joy to have learned about the four turkey method, part of your methodology and theory that I hope you'll bring up tonight. I frequently talk about that with my students. We'll so talk about that tonight too, the four turkey theory. So, um, just please welcome Dr. Lindsay Jones. a double purpose to keep away the kind of uh, half invested and to uh, leave us then with a very high quality audience. <laughs> <laughs> privilege in that way. My only disappointment is over the past several weeks when I was working on this project, and I have been working on it for several weeks, and I, I always had in my mind, like every other ACS thing that I had presented, I expected Nadar, Nadar Artemis. <laughs> keep keeping me honest, and so I'm disappointed that Nadar is not here, but I'm going to try to be honest anyway, uh, in, 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 what, in what I have to say. Now, I, I want to begin at least with, by uh, thanking you for coming, thanking our hosts for this, but also thanking the, the organizers, because I have organized enough meetings that all, these things don't come together without, uh, <coughs> without a great amount of uh, a great amount of effort, so so I uh, appreciate very much what uh, Ben and Rebecca and uh, Mikesh have done, and, and uh, I, I consider it a kind of a, a gift to be uh, able to begin. You know, if I'm a student of Mirchi Iliadi, used to have the, the prestige of the beginning. To go first is very, is, is very uh, much of a privilege and a gift, but one of the things I'm going to talk about as I move through this talk is every gift brings with it an obligation. You think you're getting a gift, you're actually getting an obligation. The, the obligation that I got, and I think it came in uh, a, uh, uh, one of uh, my correspondence with Ben, he said, uh, we, we want you to give the big view for architecture, craft, and spirituality. So this is the obligation, and this, I take my obligation very seriously in that way, and it's, but it's, a, it's a challenge for me. I've, I've thought and had a lot to say about architecture and about spirituality or Jewish religion, but craft is something kind of new. So, um, as I uh, 
uh, were I to craft this paper after this meeting, it might look very different than it is now. I'm, I'm prepared to be corrected in, in, many, in many respects, but I'm working toward my obligation there. Uh, so uh, I will introduce uh, in the latter part of the talk these uh, odd little uh, constructions of, uh, that I term architectural pedimentos. Uh, and, and I'll try to make the case, if there's any argument at stake here, that these very humble little constructions Constructions, none of which I think would earn a C minus in a video of your uh, design studio, actually can teach us something very profound uh, uh, about uh, practice craft materials to me. So I'll get back to those. Because I have a whole lot of ground to cover, uh, I have, as usual, a kind of my safety net in a, in, a, in a handout here. On the back of the handout, I just have uh, more of these uh, pedimentos to give you a sense of what I have in mind. But I'm going to be relying on this, this uh, handout and keep sort of moving away and coming back to it, and especially important that will be uh, in this, this outline of the issues here. So, so the way I'll proceed then, first, uh, I'm going to give you some uh, general background on, on Oaxaca, which is uh, one of the world's craft-rich uh, environments. Uh, and then I will, in the second part, meet my obligation by uh, talking about craft and general themes in relation to craft. And uh, that's the, the more general part. Then in the, in the, in the, the latter part, I'm, I'm going to pursue a personal interest in, in my enthusiasm to make sense of these architectural pedimentals. And I'll uh, explore whether they qualify as crafts a little bit, but I'm more interested in what's religious about them. And, and when I get to the end, I'm going to read about a two-minute uh, about a two-minute summary conclusion, but for the rest of that time, I'm just going to talk through my slides. So, so I'm, I'm apologizing at the outset, but this is, this is a complicated talk, and, and I have a many sort of, uh, I didn't say a good talk, it's a complicated talk <laughs> that, that uh, has a lot of loose ends and few certain conclusions. I want to sort of bring, bring many things to air, and I thought, you know, uh, the, the door is there. A lot of you might want to leave here. <laughs> a little pause there. I, I wouldn't hold it against no one if you do, but, but, but I really want to talk about this. Uh, in any event, as we work through these sort of uh, issues, I start with some general background about Oaxaca. Uh, it's, it's a craft rich universe. And, and so the kind of the cultural region we're looking at is Mesoamerica. And maybe some of you are familiar with the Aztecs and Mayas, but in between the Aztecs and Mayas, there's a third cultural region uh, of Zapotecs and Mishnecas and in Oaxaca, which is, sits, I say, on the, on the, the knot of the whole tie of Mesoamerica. And, and so uh, uh, Oaxaca has, uh, it's often said that all of Oaxaca is an archaeological site, because this was such a heavily he inhabited area in pre-Columbian times, but the two premier archaeological sites are, are Monte Alban, which is really the focus of my uh, ongoing research at the moment, but not really uh, much of a topic in this paper, and, and Mipla, which is, which is down the road. Uh, but both of those places are, at this point, uh, heavily commodified as tourist destinations. Okay? Uh, now, it just turned out to be in a, a kind of quirky coincidence that look at Wak and Maine, just to give you some perspective, <laughs> more, more or less the same region or the same, the, the same area, but Oaxaca is overwhelmingly mountainous, okay? Uh, in the center, there's a high valley where those archaeological sites are, but the rest of, the, of uh, Oaxaca is filled with, with very steep mountains. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, it's hard to quantify these things, but maybe 60, maybe 70 percent of Oaxaca is indigenous people, okay? Uh, so this is the most indigenous part of Mexico. And uh, if, if you look at these sort of areas, you're going to have a big Zapotec area, a large Mishtec area, but there's at least a dozen other groups. And in the whole world, in the whole globe, there are fewer places, few places that have more intensified kind of cultural linguistic diversity than than Oaxaca, which is uh, ultimately a consequence of that mountainous terrain. So there's uh, in, in many kinds of indigenous people. For the kind of uh, old hippies among you, uh, you might associate Oaxaca with Maria Sabina. This is the, the, the sort of uh, here and there a woman up here who attracted the likes of uh, Bob Dylan and, uh, and uh, John Lennon and, uh, and uh, I think Tom. 
Thomas Berry. Who <laughs> 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 kind of, uh, of, of wisdom who, who, who visited this area, or some of you who are kind of more hippies and surfers could associate Oaxaca with Zipulito Beach. These, these are famous kind of uh, world world renowned uh, beaches here. So a lot of different things going on in Oaxaca, and it is ironic then, perhaps, that these are the poorest states in Mexico. In, in the south here. And these different states sort of alternate who's the poorest, but at the moment, uh, Oaxaca is dead last. It's the poorest state in, in Mexico. These are not surprisingly then the states uh, that have the highest rates of migration to the United States. So, so if we look economically in Oaxaca now, uh, overwhelmingly, it is tourism and remittances from the United States that are, constitute the two principal sources of income. Almost everyone in Oaxaca has family or someone in the United States who is sending money back. So when I, I went to Oaxaca, I'm just coming back from Oaxaca now, but I went there in November, right after election day. So it was an intriguing environment in which to sort of watch the trepidation as they were waiting for, for Donald Trump to take, take office. And when I uh, photo, or, uh, photograph the headlines on inauguration day, they're talking about deportation and the law. Waiting or the or the uh, or the headline I like most today the nightmare begins. Uh, but then on the other hand, Oaxacans they have a sort of uh, entrepreneurial spirit. So these craft people who, who, who uh, work in the street and sell sell uh, bracelets that they make. And they tell me they're they're best. <laughs> 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 I went to Oaxaca, I had a sabbatical, I spent the whole year in Oaxaca, but when I arrived there, it was, as I said here, the, it was a battlefield. The, the city was uh, being occupied by the federal preventative police in the, in the beautiful colonial streets where, where tanks and, uh, and tanks and soldiers, and uh, I thought I'm going to take pictures of ruins, instead I'm taking pictures of people. I, I got to watch people hijack a bus and slam it into a colonial building and set it on fire. And, and all these sort of demonstrations going on, and um, <clears throat> sort of uh, 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 complicated place uh, without trying to explain all that's happening there. So if you go to Oaxaca for, for a vacation for a week, you could leave with the sense that this is the most peaceful, serene, lovely, kind of welcoming environment. But I have the advantage of learning that below the surface, I mean, there's uh, there, there's resentment, there's racism, there's extreme governmental corruption, there is a, there is a kind of a, uh, a volatility. And then that was 10 years ago, but I made a point of uh, photographing the, the newspaper the day I left the, the capital city, and it's, the city's paralyzed by uh, demonstrations, strikes, uh, different sort of blockades, and so forth. Okay, so this, this is a complicated, all sorts of stuff going on in Oaxaca, but irrespective of poverty, corruption, all this sort of political tumult, <coughs> Oaxaca is an exceptionally rich place uh, with respect to museums, institutes, studios, galleries, markets. This is such a lively kind of kind of art scene. And in fact, if you're going to see any sort of book about Mexican folk art, it's likely to describe Oaxaca as an indigenous folk art collector's paradise. And, and for many people, uh, a trip to Oaxaca turns into a shopping experience. So what are you going to buy if you go to Oaxaca for, to, to shop? You know, the sort of the, the quintessential Oaxacan craft is rugs, OK? But, but actually, there's really all textiles. And with all textiles, all sorts of clothing. But Oaxaca also has an extremely rich and multi-layered tradition of, of different kinds of ceramics. Also, Oaxaca has this tradition of, of of mines and, and metalworking. Uh, Oaxaca is kind of ground zero for a Day of the Dead imagery. Uh, the Day of the Dead is a major a tourist uh, attraction. I'm going to come back in a few minutes and talk about these kind of Alavrio wood carvings, which are the most probably high profile Oaxaca crafts at the moment. And, and then you can talk about mezcal. You know, mezcal for a long time was a, was a poor man's drink. You know? But now, uh, mezcal is being marketed as a kind of bebido uh, artisan. Artisan now, you know, a kind of a craft drink. It's, it's, it's a hip, cool thing to be drinking mezcal. So, uh, the, all this art uh, and our artesanía and uh, craft things are happening in 
Oaxaca, but just as a kind of summarize this little arc of the talk, I think the fabulously rich and diverse array of handicrafts in Oaxaca is enhanced by at least three things. First, it's enhanced by the challenges of poverty. And in fact, uh, before I started working and thinking about this, it never occurred to me. This is, this is ironic and troubling and, and disturbing. I thought I want to talk to you about kind of the religious dimensions of craft. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the politics and economics. So you can't not talk about the politics and economics. It's, it's no coincidence that the poorest state in Oaxaca is the richest state in craft. So this, this connection with poverty and craft is, is, uh, is profound uh, and, and unmistakable. Second is the kind of extreme cultural ethnic diversity. That there's so many different people in, in Oaxaca that this sort of uh, enhances the, the, the wealth of crafts. And third, there is this uh, very strong continuity of pre-Columbian native traditions. There, there are you know, still most parts of most villages in Oaxaca you can't get to with a, on a paved road even now. Okay? So anyway, with that little, uh, those, that general background in, in mind. Now I want to <coughs> switch to the more general discussion of criterion for crafts. And, and what you'll find on your handout is a list of 10 highly debatable, uh, quite uh, redundant in some ways, criterion, which you could think of as sort of a, a yes or no checklist. But I'm, that would be one way to work with this. But I, I have more in mind that these 10 things are like topics and tensions. So, I'm going to uh, introduce the first five, then talk about some specific things, eventually come back to, to the second five. Okay? In, in any event, we're trying to figure out what, what is a craft? Uh, so when we get some clues, I'll go to Oaxaca de Juarez's premier handicraft market, which is then one of the premier handicraft markets in, in Mexico. And see, well, what do they put in the handicraft market? What do they think a, a craft is? And you're going to find all these textile sort of things, and you're going to sort of uh, find artisans on hand. People want to know not only the stuff, but they want to meet the makers, OK? Uh, but then you also encounter a lot of things that seem like they might more suitably be called souvenirs than crafts, and kind of uh, tacky day of the dead stuff, these, uh, these low-brow Isle of Greenhouse and so forth. So I try to think about how to sort of narrow the focus of what a craft is. Now, for me, one of the ways in which I decided to narrow that focus was by, for the purposes of this paper, thinking about crafts as material objects, as things. If you think about craft, it could be a process or a tradition and so forth. But I'm interested in the stuff. I'm interested in the end products. And the reason I'm interested in the end products is because in, in my career and in this sort of uh, past several years, I've been working to come to terms with what uh, anthropologists and religious studies people call over the past 15 years the material term. I got my own ambivalence about making the material term, but if you think about uh, the work of uh, someone like, uh, uh, who's written this book, Things, uh, Religion and the, and, the, and the Question of Materiality, uh, describing uh, the material term as nothing less than a kind of critical rethinking of the relation between religion and materiality. It was religion and stuff, religion and things. And Birgit Meyer, the author of that book, is trying to make the case that, that overwhelmingly uh, scholars of religion have been seduced or misled or are under the influence of certain kind of modern and especially Protestant presuppositions, which have led us to the mistaken notion that religion is principally about beliefs and ideas. Religion is not about beliefs and ideas, according to the material term. It's not the thought that counts. Religion, according to the, those who make the material term, the new materialists, who not like the Marxist materialists, say religion uh, resides or reveals itself foremost in the concrete practices and interactions with material objects and stuff. So if I'm going to go into an indigenous village, I want to find a religion. You think what, what you're going to look for is find out what these people believe. I want to see how they talk about the beginning of the world, the afterlife. So the, the, those on the material terms say, that's not the way you're going to find out about the religion. Pay attention to the way they engage and, and exchange material objects. By the same token, if you want to know what's going on with contemporary American Christians, 
you know, you could uh, interview them about how they think of the doctrine of grace, but the material turn says, no, pay attention to the way in which they interact with and exchange material objects, okay? So uh, in, in uh, Mesoamerica, there's a lot of work that sort of uh, reflects the material turn by focusing on images and, and, and offerings and so forth. This book is, is particularly influential in my thinking about this, and it suggests What's going on in, in religion in Oaxaca is an indigenous Oaxacan logic of reciprocity based on giving material things in the expectation of receiving material things. So, I mean, there was one arc, uh, one uh, iteration of this talk that was all about the material turn. I kind of pushed the material turn into the background, but we're going to see it reappear, and it has a lot to do with the way we're thinking about these things. Okay? In any event, if we go to this list of, of my 10 criteria, uh, invariably, when people talk about crafts, they suggest that crafts are individually handmade, perhaps with simple tools, but they're not factory made or mass produced. So some about crafts being handmade are important, okay? And I thought, for this, this is a special occasion. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to buy a new shirt for this, for this one. Is it I'll go to meet I'm going to do that. I've got to get a handmade shirt. So I guess that's, What's sort of the prestige of handmade? Well, I don't know, but we're going to keep hearing a lot about handmade, okay? Second criteria that is often put forth about crafts is that they are connected to quotidian, uh, utilitarian, and or obligatory life skills. On my list of 10 things, two stand out to me as particularly important as a historian of religions, and, and this second one is, uh, is one of those two. So if we look around and we see kind of what the most sort of typical things that are being sold as crafts, well, one sort of standard thing is kitchen implements, okay? So you're going to get like stirrers and forks and spoons, maybe combs and things uh, like this. So you think of something like these stylized spoons. In a way, uh, you might be able to make the case that, that uh, these are quintessential crafts in so far as you can use these spoons to stir your soup or you can hang them on the wall. Okay? But they're, they're utilitarian and decorative. They're not just decorative. Okay? So I'll be back to that um, at several points. The, the third, fourth, and fifth ones are, are closely related. Okay? Um, because we are frequently going to hear then that crafts are regionally specific, made with local unprocessed material, they're not generic or universalistic. And as I worked and thought hard about crafts, I kept encountering the notion that globalization is a threat to crafts. That the, the kind of uh, uh, standardization and uh, homogenization that comes with globalization is a threat to the, the regional specificity of crafts. In any event, closely related to that is the notion that crafts are representative and supportive of distinct sociocultural identities. And in Oaxaca, you see the identity that's most important is a village identity. Not an ethnic identity, not a linguistic identity, not a national identity, but the village that people live in. Be back in just a moment to talk about kind of craft specific villages. Or, or likewise related to that is the notion that crafts are conventionalized and credited uh, to a group or collective, not personalized, idiosyncratic, or artist specific. And this, this is the, the notion then uh, that uh, crafts emerge uh, from, from groups, from communities. And, and uh, I think the Prem will get us thinking about this again tomorrow. But the crafts are not, generally speaking, an environment for individual uh, personalized expression. If, if we think of those sort of uh, altogether debatable things, you see that crafts are uh, privileged the local and the collective. Specific crafts are correlated with specific places and specific communities. Now, now one of the things that I really love in Oaxaca, and, and it's a lot of fun to to take advantage of it is the fact that, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, the Mexican government put forward this plan where they were willing to sponsor and support indigenous communities who wanted to build their own museums. Because there's always a problem, you know, when outsiders build a museum, the way they're going to represent indigenous communities, the, the, the government said we're going to uh, provide these communities with the resources and logistical support so they can decide for themselves, represent themselves. And in Oaxaca, there are about two dozen of these uh, communitarian museums. Over time, I visited about 20 of them, which is 18 more than anybody else. <laughs> 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 if 
you go to these museums, they're always funny. It's, you know, uh, Lupita's cousin has the key, and she goes to the market on Wednesday. Can you come back tomorrow? Or the, you know, no one's been to the museum for eight months. Or, you know, or the, and it's funny these little things in these museums, but they always are going to key on their craft specialization. And in fact, this whole area of, of Oaxaca was under the sway of the Aztec Empire. So if we go back and look at these sort of records about the tribute that different uh, people within the Aztec Empire pay, play, it, it's conceivable that these villages were paying their tribute to the Aztecs uh, according to their craft specializations. Okay? So, so I do this only in a kind of a, a rapid fire way, but it was uh, fascinating and interesting to me to realize when you go to these these little villages and talk to people and, and they're in their museum, they're saying, identify yourself, represent yourself, who are you? And, and a village like this says, we are the makers of palm products. And their whole museum is about how they're gonna make, uh, you know, baskets and hats. These are some kind of palm sleeves that people are burying or something, but this is their, their primary sort of identity. We go to another village and they have mines there. So they say, you know, who, who are you? We are we are miners and we are specialists in in metalwork and so forth. This is this is their identity. Or, or this village uh, uh, capitalizes and accentuates its sort of special uh, skill in healing or in midwifery and so forth. Uh, or uh, in in this museum, they are going to talk about. Uh, their craft specialization as stone cutters and, and, and the innovations that they take credit for in this village in, in stone cutting. Or, or this is, uh, you know, just a kind of a tiny little two-room museum and it's one of the many weaving villages and there are dozens of weaving villages in Oaxaca, but, but this guy's telling me how, yeah, but we weave different. We, we got our own way of weaving. Everybody's got the, the, the distinctive way of, of weaving or, or one of the most famous craft villages in Oaxaca is this uh, San Bartola Coyote Pack, where they make this distinctive kind of black pottery, this, this uh, Baro Negro pottery. And, uh, you know, I found this charming book of, from back uh, in the 50s, this guy, John Skeeping, who's a British sculptor. He goes to Oaxaca specifically to learn the, the ceramic techniques from these people in, in uh, San Bartola. And he's talking about how you they, they break all the rules, all the kind of conventional Western rules about firing pots and so forth, but they come up with these, uh, these marvelous things nonetheless. So that's, that's their specialization. Or, or another uh, <coughs> particularly sort of uh, famous weaving village is uh, Santa Ana del Valle. And if you go to the, their, the, the museum in this, in this little village, that they're going to be talking a lot about their sort of expertise in natural dyes. And, and uh, not just traditional weaving techniques, but these, these natural dyes and colors. And we're going to hear about the cochinilla, but this, this particular sort of bug that lived on a cactus that when you squash it, it's bright red. This was Oaxaca's primary expert for a long time, this, this bright red dye until synthetic dyes took, took over. So they're going to be uh, uh, celebrating their identity as uh, connected to the maintenance of these traditional <coughs> skills. Now, uh, a uh, village I want to pay a little more attention to, but probably, uh, certainly, the most famous craft village in all of Oaxaca is Teotitlan de Valle. And Teotitlan de Valle makes, makes rugs. But you can see, this is a sign to get the Teotitlan de Valle. This is my, this is my car on the way. But they got, they got a pretty sign, and their English is correct. And, and when you get there, you know, and it, it looks kind of like a boutique. And Teotitlan de Valle has a bunch of these kind of famous, uh, renowned artisans, so individuals who have gotten large reputations, okay? And in fact, uh, a few years ago when I was in Washington doing something at Catholic University, uh, I, I slipped off and went to the Museum of the American Indian. They're having a, a kind of a display of craft specializations. There's only one Mexican in the mix, who is, of course, from Teotitlan de Valle. And, and he's talking about uh, a display in which he is is uh, demonstrating his facility with these natural dyes. But, but I, I bring them to our attention because something that comes up again and again in all this material is a kind of a tension and contradictions in, in these different priorities. Because the Teotitlan de Valle, they have a deep fidelity to tradition. They want to they proceed in these traditional ways. 
but you've got these kind of uh, uh, cosmopolitan and, and inventive artists, and they want to, they're not content just to replicate the things, the traditional forms. They, they want to, to, to do new and different things, and then Teotihuacan de Valle, better than any other village, has found out ways to make money from this. There's always kind of a profit motive. These three sort of things are, are often in tension in, the, in these craft environments, and we'll see that uh, um, reappearing. Here I, I'm, I'm uh, disappointed, Rebecca, with nothing to say about to a wild turkey, but I'm still going to make a little comment about mezcal. Because if we go down the road uh, from <coughs> Teotihuacan, the Valle, uh, there, there's a village of Matatlan. And, and Matatlan is, is, uh, realizes, it seems, that they really can't distinguish themselves among these other sort of weaving villages, so they designate themselves as the self-proclaimed world capital of Mezcal. <laughs> this is going to make their, their, their specialization. In fact, Mezcal is, uh, you know, 98% of all Mezcal comes from Oaxaca, and most of it comes from this area. Uh, but as I said before, Mezcal is, uh, you know, transformed from this kind of cheap drunk to, to, a, to, a, to a, 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 a kind of a craft drink, but this is, uh, as we look at the marketing me mezcal, uh, it gives me an occasion to revisit these, these five criteria one, almost one last time, I'll do it one example. But, but this kind of niche marketing, because, because mezcal has become uh, popular outside of Oaxaca de Juarez, they built a mezcal factory. Uh, where they can make a lot of mezcal, but everyone you talk to will tell you, yeah, but that's not where the good mezcal is coming from. The good mezcal is coming from these factory, these family operations where they've got a burrow and they're, and they're smashing the agave by hand. That, that, that is, it's handmade mezcal. Uh, second, they're going to keep telling you, you know, mezcal is not like Corona Light. This, this is not a recreational drink. Mezcal is a, is a ceremonial drink. We drink mezcal at all of our important kind of uh, civic and religious occasions. There's a certain kind of a, a seriousness and obligatory in nature to drinking mezcal. Likewise, then they're going to talk about mezcal is regionally specific. You know, the mezcal from Western Oaxaca doesn't, doesn't cut it. It's, it's the mezcal that they get here. And then, you know, there's a little slippage in the sense that it's not always kind of associated with communities, but now most mezcal operations are families. Okay? But uh, nonetheless, much to be learned from, from that. Now, before I go to these uh, second five things, I want to do a little sort of riff on the Alabrijo wood carvings. Uh, and I think uh, probably uh, some of you are familiar with these when you begin to see them. If you're not, you Google Alabrijo and find uh, thousands of them. And, and they're useful in this conversation because they kind of undermine or stress each of these generalizations about crafts. Now, uh, if Matatlan is going to uh, pr present itself and designate itself the world capital of Mezcal, you get a whole nother set of villages who want to present themselves as the world capital of El Brijas, or, or the home of El Brijas, or they're going to try to claim that, claim that mantle. And there's, there's a fair amount, not a fair, it's a small amount, but useful literature about the, the, the actually short history of El Brijas, but I find most uh, uh, myself most in agreement with Michael Chitnik's sort of work on, on Alabrijas. So, uh, in any event, these wood carvings are often have this kind of uh, like composite animal form, like a fish with, with arms and legs, or some are kind of goofy, like this moose, or, or, or some, there, there's a lot of dinosaurs and, uh, and dragons. Some are more veristic, like this monkey, but a lot of them are just kind of fantastic in this way. Some are kind of uh, distinguished and stately, like this bowl that's really a, a polished sort of production. But then a lot of El Brijas are, are kind of cheap like this. So you could spend $100 or you could spend $1,000 on El Brija, or you could buy these kind of low-end El Brijas for four or five dollars. Uh, so that there's a full range of these that are at kind of the high end or, 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 or at the low end. Uh, that are uh, in, enjoying a various prestige. So what are they? Where do they come from? What, what is that? Okay. What do we know about this? And I have my own opinions, but they're informed also by Chibnik. I don't want to kind of hang it all on him. We'll do this together. 
what, what often you will hear when, you say, what, when, you, when you're going to buy an L3 hive, say, where, where did, what is this form? And they'll tell you that, that the, the artist had a vision. You know, he had a dream, and, a, and, and this was some sort of apparition, and then he carved it. But, but Michael Chibnick is just suspicious of that thing. Very few L3 nuts really arise from artists uh, who are uh, depicting their, their dream apparitions. Likewise, in Oaxaca, there's a, in the pre-Columbian context a, a, a tradition of a lot of spirit animals and, and animals in mythology, but these animals don't seem to be connected with that history. Likewise, uh, there's a history in Oaxaca of kind of wood carved masks and some toys, but they don't seem to be connected with that. Well, what uh, Chimnik concludes and what I attempt to agree, these are quirky <laughs> figures that tourists will buy. Okay? And in fact, he's going to say, Ella Frijas really are the quintessential invented tradition. We're talking here about the, the premier Oaxacan craft at the moment, but he sees this as a, as a quintessential example of the commodification of crafts. And, and after he was studying this with thoroughness, he's saying in 1960, in Oaxaca, there was probably one individual at most who made a, a living full time as a wood carver. In the 1980s, 1990s, these things kind of take off and they, and they begin to uh, find the market and, and more people go to work on this. But this is a kind of a, a craft tradition that's not threatened by globalization. This is a craft tradition that finds an audience in American tourists and, and globalization make, makes it go, okay? But what uh, Chibnick thinks, and, and I agree that if Americans uh, stop buying Alabrijas tomorrow, Oaxacans well, would immediately stop making them, okay? So, so that, then we'll think about these sort of five criteria once more, and then we'll push to the other five. Because Alabrijas, and they will always tell you, and they always say, these are handmade. And they are handmade, but there is always this kind of an incentive toward mass production in the sense that you're going to find some villages that they just, they just do the carving, or they just carve one time, and then they're going to pass them off to someone else who's going to paint them, they're going to pass them off to someone else who's who's going to market them. So by the time you buy an L3 has, it's always a touch and go about who, who made it, OK? Uh, in, in terms of this sort of notion that's so important to me about whether they're connected to quotidian utilitarian things, absolutely not. There's no tradition of this. These are, these are, these are fantasy sort of figures. They're regionally specific, but then you can see, as they emerge in this way, that all these different sort of villages want to claim the, the regional specificity. So San Martin, Tilcajete, you know, they're going to put on their sign, we're the El Brija place, okay? Uh, and they're going to be outraged because now they're making El Brijas in China. <laughs> if, you, if you buy El Brijas, if you buy Oaxacan El Brijas online, you're liable to get China made ones if you're not, uh, <coughs> if, you're, if you're not careful. Moreover, a troubling sort of, uh, way in which El Brija phenomenon works, the, these main villages that make El Brijas are not indigenous villages. These are mestizo villages, and the people, if you, if you talk to the craftsmen, they don't claim to be indigenous, but by the time they pass through these networks and get marketed, they are very frequently presented as indigenous crafts. They're not made by indigenous people, but if they're for Americans, Americans want something made by indigenous people rather than Mexican mestizos. Okay? So they are rep representatives of, of, uh, of particular sort of communities, and a place like San Martin is going to have an annual uh, El Abrija fair. But then when we look into this a little further, the very first uh, annual El Abrija fair was in 2008. So this is, for better or worse, this is a, this is a brand new thing. That's in 2008. That's in the, in the wake of El Conflicto that I talked about. OK? Uh, and <coughs> if we... Uh, are usually talking about how crafts are connected to collective rather than individuals. In the Alabrija world, there are individuals and this sort of extreme cutthroat competition between particular individuals. And if you go to the, these villages, you're going to find then just even on one street, various sort of family cons constituencies who are competing with one another to, to sell these Alabrija. There's more to say about El Brijas along the way, but I just sort of keep them in mind as I uh, enumerate these other, the, the second five things and, and move ahead. Uh, because we're often going to hear then, 
Number six, that crafts are exemplary of long practice manufacturing skills and techniques. They're not expeditious and streamlined. So there could be an easier way to do it, but people won't go the easy way. They, they want to do it the traditional way. So often where crafts are sold, you have demonstrations of the way crafts were made. We see Alabrijas, uh, again, uh, undermine that notion that uh, you've got all sorts of people painting Alabrijas and then spray paint or car paint or house paint or whatever they can. Or they have these concessions where you can paint your own Alabrijas. And, or, or you can actually make your own. So this is a marketing them in a, in a somewhat different way. In any event, just to to break and then and then come to a point that I regard as particularly important in this whole list, nothing is more sort of significant to me as a historian of religions than point number seven and the recurrent sort of claim that that crafts are repositories of traditional cosmologies, mythologies, and religious conceptions. They're not frivolous or new fact, but there's something of the endurance of, of religious conceptions uh, contained within crafts. Two excellent examples uh, come first in, uh, in, in thinking about this form here, which is the, this is a, a Greco or a stepped fret, okay? And, and this sort of side of this is, is usually understood to somehow be symbolic of a mountain that this other part that's like a swirl seems somehow to be symbolic of water. We juxtapose the two, that they are symbolic of the sort of juxtaposition of mountains and waters, or in Mesoamerican traditions, the notion of an ultipet, of, of a, a, a mountain of sustenance, a mountain that is filled with water. And this is a, this is a very rich and, and widely circulated sort of religious idea, but you can see here it's a prominent motif on buildings that uh, pre-Columbian buildings that were built a thousand years ago. It's a prominent motif in uh, crafts that are made that are made present. Next week I'm invited to a, a conference in Oaxaca that's all about the step fret and, and, and sort of the way this this thing has been kept alive. A second similarly good example of the way in which crafts act as repositories of religious ideas come in uh, women's blouses or wheat heels. And, and in the Oaxaca zone, likewise in the Maya zone, these sort of pretty designs are actually, in, in nearly all cases, some sort of cosmogram, some sort of map of the structure of the universe. And so when a woman puts herself in a wheat heel, she, she puts her head in a certain place in the cosmos. And, and so the wheat fields are, are really uh, uh, filled with kind of uh, insights into uh, native conceptions of time and space. It likewise give me a segue to, to go to my point number eight insofar as crabs are often uh, depicted as protective of makers' distinctive ethnic values and investments. In other words, with, where crafts are concerned, there's a kind of defensiveness and a, and a proprietary ownership. These are our crafts. We make these crafts. You can't make these. these. They belong to our village and so forth. And if you know your way around wheat fields, which I can't really claim to, but of all the villages in Oaxaca, they all have distinctive wheat fields. And if you go to a market and, and you're with someone who knows, they can say that she's from this village, she's from this village, she's from this And you won't wear somebody else's wheat field. And the more I started thinking about it, it seemed like biker gangs or something. <laughs> <laughs> One of kind of, you don't just use someone else's colors. They, they're, they own their, their wheat peel designs, okay? And so like one other sort of um, topic in that respect, if you look at back to a village like Teotihuacan de Valle, you know, they are invested in, in tradition, but they also have artistic expression and want to make some money. In Teotihuacan de Valle, they realize that Americans want some Navajo rugs. There's a market for Navajo rugs. So in Teotihuacan de Valle, they started making Navajo rugs because they, they can sell them. And you can do, you read on Navajo sites, and they're saying these Zapotecs are counterfeiters. They're they're thieves. They're to, you know so the, the the kind of the, the this notion of ownership perhaps is 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 rich too. I want to deal very quickly with these last two topics uh, and and uh, then head toward impediment. Because uh, there is a suggestion then that uh, that crafts are sustained in large part by intrinsic other than monetary motivations. But you can be just about money. You're going to make some money, but there's got to be some other motivation. But when you look at various sorts of phenomena, and again, Alabrijas are the most sort of obvious, especially if you're buying them off the 
Mexican chic boutique website or something, <laughs> that it's really is merchandise, you know, that, 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 it's, that it's really is profit motive. And Oaxaca, because they're trying always to attract tourists, they have many circumstances in which they display in prominent ways in the, uh, their annual sort of Gutsa uh, festival the, their, their traditions and their crafts. And, and they are uh, applauded for preserving tradition in this way. And on the other hand, these events are routinely boycotted. And these are their, their sellouts. And this is, a, this is a horrible sort of development. Okay. So we'll pass this. The, the last uh, thing on my list raises the always thorny uh, question of authenticity. And any one of you who have visited a, an archaeological ruin in Mexico in the last 30 years have probably been approached by, by uh, these characters who are making replicas, okay? That there's a, uh, I find very interesting reflections on these, these uh, craft makers who many people regard as, as nothing but parasites. Just a few weeks ago, I spent about two hours talking to this guy. I don't think I believe anything he told me. <laughs> but, but they are, the, the way the conversation usually goes, they'll approach you and they say, you, you know, here, we make replicas of things, and, and would you like to buy this? Once they develop a little rapport, then they're going to dig deeper in their pocket, and they'll come out with something like these. And these are authentic, pre Columbian. It's illegal to have these, it's illegal to sell these, it's illegal to. But I'm going to enrich your experience in Mexico. You can, you can buy these. And so, so, so there's this sort of ongoing representation of things. These guys actually belong to, to, to a union, and, and they have a complicated uh, sort of relationship with the authorities at, at the site. But uh, for my purposes, without sort of going too far down this rat's nest, I'm, I'm thinking of authenticity means just that things are honestly represented. So if, if this is an honestly represented uh, as a replica, then it's an authentic replica. Or if you get uh, outside the site and you have these kind of cheap replicas that are represented as cheap replicas, those are authentic cheap replicas. Okay? Uh, but, but, uh, but without exploring that too much, you just sort of end this, this uh, art of the talk by seeing that you know, almost every feature of shopping in Oaxaca is characterized by this sort of uh, necessity of buyer beware, that, that things may not be exactly how they're, how they're being represent. Okay. At any rate, this was uh, the moment which I invited lots of you to leave. <laughs> if you want to go, but I, I'm, going to, I'm going to sort of begin again and, and talk about archite uh, architectural pedimentos, uh, uh, which is a, a related but a somewhat distinct thing. Okay, and this is something that has uh, fascinated me. So. Uh, I, I wanted to look at two specific cases and then provide uh, some general interpretive remarks, remarks that apply to both. Okay? So in your handout, um, just, just two key terms here. A pedimento. Uh, the term pedimento comes from the Spanish verb pedir. So it means to ask or request or, or best of all to petition. So a pedimento is an object or an offering that petitions. So it's a, instead of uh, like a prayer when you would make a, 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 a petition, you, you make some thing, some, some object with which you issue your petition either to a person or a group or a deity and so forth. Architectural pedimentos then are going to be those kind of pedimentos that are built or made objects, often resembling a house or a domestic setting, albeit in schematic and uh, metonymic ways, which expresses one's petition. But these are going to be pedimentos kind of look like houses, okay? So, so in this case, I'm saying these are, you know, these are rough little things, but there is uh, much to be learned from them. Now, now, I would venture to say you probably will never find anywhere in academic literature the term architectural pediment. There's not much written about this, but, but uh, the two premier places to, to see this and get a handle on what's going on with this, is both in Oaxaca, are the Cross of Miracles and, and in this site of Aquila, okay? So I have something to say about the Cross of Miracles and uh, talk about Aquila and, uh, and then end with some interpretation about why I think these are significant and, um, and, and religious, okay? In, in any event, with respect to the Cross of Miracles, um, it is near the site of Mitla, 
And uh, this famous uh, folklorist and anthropologist, Elsie Clues Parsons, wrote, wrote a marvelous sort of ethnography of Mi'kma based on her stays there in the late 20s and early 30s. And at one point when I had, I had, a, I had a brilliant idea, so I'm going to go to Mi'kma and I'll live in Mi'kma for a month or two and just, just to reread this book. Just so I can, I can sit there and read it where she wrote it. Uh, and and it, was, uh, it was a powerful experience. And, and uh, in that experience, I was particularly impressed because she's interested in Serrano pilgrims, Indians that don't live in Mitla, that live in the surrounding mountains, who come to visit Mitla now and then. And, and she says when they come to visit Mitla, especially on New Year's Eve, but at other times, a, a, a pilgrim to the Mitla area is going to want to stop it five different places, okay? First, because all these people in the, in the late 20s and 30s, everyone in this story in this part of Mexico is going to claim to be a Catholic, okay? And, and the, so the first place they want to go is to the Catholic Church, which could be a place they could offer some pedimentos or something. A second place is to the lake, uh, the so-called Lake of White Water. A third place those pilgrims would uh, like to have gone is to uh, a place called Devil's Cave, which was a site of traditional worship, but which uh, the Spanish uh, Catholics were trying to stigmatize and keep people away from us, designated as, as Devil's Cave, but people nonetheless continue to go there, and this is another place to, to offer to offer pedimentos. Uh, and then fourth, in, in the late 20s and 30s, when these uh, pilgrims came from out of town to Mitla, they were particularly fascinated to go to the ruins of Mitla, the ruins where we see these breakfasts and so forth. And in the 20s and 30s, they were particularly preoccupied with this post, which, which they labeled the uh, column of death, or in some cases, the column of life. But, but then you think they're going to sort of, this is a propitious place from which to, to offer your pedimentos and so forth. Anyway, uh, with respect to the present conversation, she also discovers in the late 20s that outside of town is this, is this thing called, called the Cross of Miracles, okay? The Cross of Miracles is it's about five miles here. The Cross of Miracles is located exactly on the boundary between the land of Matatuan and, and the land that's controlled by the people of Mitla. But it's out in the middle of a cactus field, okay? Uh, and so uh, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. This is the only written source I've found about the Cross of Miracles. I've seen it's like four or 500 years old. I think the Cross of Miracles is about 100 years old. I think it was built right after the, the Mexican Revolution as a, as a surveyor's marker to resolve some kind of land disputes between the two communities. So it's not a religious, specifically religious place, but very quickly it begins to accumulate these sort of traditions in which people make some sort of prayer here or some petition which is answered. Most, most uh, famously or most commonly a petition for a baby. Okay? Uh, and then when that is granted, other people come there and so by the time Parsons uh, happens on to the Cross of Miracles in the, in the late 20s, this, has, this is a, a growing enthusiasm for, for this place. And there are other forces that are kind of forestalling the visitation of the ruins as they try to turn this into a more kind of sanitized tourist environment. So this is really gaining energy when she looks at it. And what really impresses her is that when she goes out there, she finds people making these pedimentos. And this is on your handout. It's a little hard to uh, see exactly what she means, but she's describing how out in front of the cross, people lay out these sort of uh, a, a ring of stones within which they build a kind of a panorama of the uh, of the domestic world in which they wish they lived. So there's there's plenty of animals and there's money and there's corn and there's and there's a swing, there'll be children there and, and there'll be you know a burrow and so forth. So so she this is her picture from the you know around 1930. Now after reading um, <coughs> Parsons, because I got no one in Meatla ever suggested I go there. Then I'm trying to figure out where this place is. I first went there in 2007, and I was uh, thrilled and excited to see people were still making these pedimentos. Then over the next uh, 10 years, I, I go there with some frequency. And every time I visit, I find people making these little things, okay? Uh, and you find a few of these, these around, okay? So these are kind of built objects which are 
uh, expressing someone's petition, thanks, or acknowledgement. Uh, uh, the, the, my last visit with there was just a few weeks ago in March. Someone had dropped off a, a looked like sort of a scrap from some sort of building project, and people immediately started using this cut stone to build some unprecedentedly big pediment post. Okay? Uh, now, I could trace these back, I think, or I have an idea as I try to make sense of these, but they really belong to a tradition that goes back to the notion of sacred bundles and so forth. But I won't bother you with this, but I just sort of mention three things that I think are driving my fascination with these. Because first, that they're explicitly architectural. And there's something profound. You know, you want a better life, you know what you need? A better built environment or something. And somehow the petition that's, that's made in the form of architecture. Second, to me, they speak to this kind of widespread satisfaction derived from making and building, okay? These are not like artists or specialists. Everybody goes out to this, to this cactus field and they start making something. They don't just sort of speak your petition. They make something that their petition. To me, that's, that's a fascinating sort of notion. And third is that the satisfaction in pedimental making is not contingent on artistic talent or skill. They're not, they're not impressive. It's just in terms of the sort of the, 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 their quality, they, they're not much good, but they're still somehow working. That's not what makes them work or fail, okay? Now, now I'll be back to those three things again, but let me just sort of uh, give you an update on what happened with the Cross of Miracles and then more quickly on Kukila, because this is, this is Parsons' picture of the Cross of Miracles in the 30s. Eventually, someone builds this little sort of house around it, uh, if you visit it today, you would see that they're always dressing the cross up. We all always different kind of coals on the cross, and people are leaving these sort of sort of offerings here. There's a cave up here, but behind the cross, my, my initial sort of guides to the cave were, were, were Javier and Jorge, a couple little boys who came to the cave, and, and they live at the cross. And over the next ten years, I I enjoyed watching Javier and Jorge grow up. And then these uh, these these uh, are a couple of my my, my favorite kids, uh, but they, they uh, don't spend a lot of time there. So now, if you visit the Cross of Miracles on an ordinary day, uh, you're going to find very few people there, maybe no one. And what you'll find is some sort of a raggedy pedimento that's sort of falling apart. Maybe someone scavenged a piece of it to, to start their own new one. There's some, or you find some people out in the field looking for some uh, new materials. But in many instances, I have found myself completely alone. Cross of miracles. No one, no one's there. But then the big exception is on New Year's Day. Okay? And, and in the days approaching New Year's Day, I remind you that the Cross of Miracles is right on the boundary line between uh, these these two villages. So on in, uh, approaching New Year's Day, the people of Matadlan set up these booths on this side, people of Mikla set up booths on this side, and uh, you know, according to the paper, maybe uh, nine or ten thousand people. This last New Year's Day happened to be on a Sunday, so I said there were probably more people than, than uh, certainly more than I had seen on any other occasion. But but people come uh, in large numbers and they go to these these vendors. What do they buy? Well, there's other things for sale. But most intriguingly in this conversation is what I'm calling, for lack of a better name, prefab architectural pediment. <laughs> they buy these little sort of model houses. Or you can get a you know you get a little plastic chair here or something whatever you want you get a little car or or you get a little baby or or you know you get, a, you get another sort of vehicle or I guess if, you, if you're going to uh, make your petition in the form of airplane you want to take a trip or something so so there are going to be uh, a few people who come and they're going to make traditional pedimentos but more people are going to buy one of these things and then they're going to approach the cross with their with their prefab pedimento. And, and so I leave it there, or maybe rub it against the cross, or, or something like this. But uh, I'll come back to this momentarily. But uh, I think this is reflecting this indigenous Oaxacan logic <coughs> based on giving material things in expectation of receiving material things. And not a lot of preaching going on at, at, the, at the Cross of Miracles. It's just the exchange of stuff. You give some stuff, and, and, you, and you get some stuff. So people are going to pin some things on the cross, or a few people we really know. So I'll put a finer point on that in a minute, but I want to just to quickly talk about Ukila and then, and then give my final interpretive remarks. Because the other place that you're going to see uh, pedimentos that get some large play is at uh, uh, 
the, the site of uh, Hukila, which is uh, Santa Catarina, Hukila, which is down in uh, south, southwestern Oaxaca, down toward Puerto Escondido. And this is Mexico's third most prominent pilgrimage destination. So, so this is a place on a wholly different sort of order. Instead of in a year attracting eight, eight or 10,000 people, it attracts like two million people come. And this is a site, uh, nearly every pilgrim to the, to the uh, site of Hukila is gonna make two stops. And, and one stop is to the main sanctuary. And the main sanctuary houses the miraculous image of Hukila. And, and the miracle associated with Hukila is, is, is one of the most sort of uh, commonplace miracles in the sense that in the 17th century, this, this image was in a, in a church and the church burned down and the church is all destroyed, but the image survives un, unscathed. And since then it's been treated as a miraculous image, but then there are a lot of kind of smaller images connected with Hukila. So, so traditionally, through the most of the 19th and 20th century, people are going to approach the image of Hukila <coughs> on their knees. Now, obviously, there just a, again just a few weeks ago, and there's a major kind of a renovation in, in the works, and they got rid of all the pews because they got to get now they got to get two million people got to pass through here, and and they sort of clean this up in a in a way. But what you have in this way then is this kind of antiseptic environment. You've got some you know, some TV monitors here and telling you don't leave anything here. You can't leave your stuff here. You want to do something else, you want to leave stuff. There's about five miles away, there is a place <coughs> called Pedimento, okay? Or El Cerro Pedimento, which is the Pedimento Mountain. And so the, the, the sort of uh, well-controlled and quiet sanctuary is contrasted to this Pedimento environment, which is more rambunctious and, and you know, energetic. And what's happening at uh, El Pedimento is people who arrive and, and they're going to bring their banners and their, you know, the, this group of uh, moto taxi drivers are came or this is someone's on there. Uh, these motorcyclists are made their, their eighth pilgrimage here or there's a lot of bicycle groups that, that come to Pedimento or, or here's a woman who had prayed to the Virgin of Bukila to help get her through college. Now she's, she graduated, she came back to thank her for this, but she makes a banner. So the, so the trees are filled with banners that people are leaving. And, and uh, there are hundreds, there are actually thousands of crosses that are, that are stuck in the ground at Hukila. And there's so many crosses here that, that they are, uh, and, and writing on the buildings, that it becomes a kind of a full-time project. You've got to shovel the offerings away to make room for the next, because there's so many people coming and leaving stuff here at El Pedimento. Now, the part that really fascinated me uh, and in relation to this conversation, that also at, at El Pedimento, they have a few of these little on-site workshops. Well, it's a workshop, even though there's not much of a workshop to it. Um, <clears throat> but it's a, it's a, they, they have some water available there and some, some work sort of bench places, okay? But what makes these sort of uh, fascinating and useful is that the building material is the mountain, okay? And the, the very El uh, Cerro Pedimento on which they are standing is made of this sort of clay dirt. So at these sites, they, they're, they're taking this dirt and then they are making their pedimentos. So, so the kind of things that, that emerge from these little workshops, this is where I was thinking, I could imagine what, what would happen if Rebecca got into the workshop. All kind of stuff would come out. There's room for uh, uh, lots of possibilities, but what they're making, a lot of them kind of look like gingerbread men. Or, uh, uh, there's shapes that you know you're going to get some hearts and some little trucks, and uh, some people have stars, or some people make these sort of trucks. Another way you could go would get some model trucks and then just put the, the, the clay mud over them. Uh, but whatever you make, then is going to be deposited on the on the hillside. Okay. Uh, or some of it gets pressed up against the wall in these, in these pedimentos. Or, or this is a woman I met here, and her, her practice involved sort of, uh, she's got some sort of illness she's dealing with, but she wants to put the mud all over her stomach here, okay? Uh, in any event, then, more specifically, are there architectural pedimentos in the mix, okay? And, and certainly there are. Though so this is a different kind of material, so you don't get the same thing we saw at the Cross of Miracles, as they're dealing with this mud, and sometimes they have to use some 
you know, some cardboard or some wood. Some of these pedimentals seem clearly to have been made at home and then they come and put them there. But these are the, the traditional Ukela pedimentals, which are made out of this, which are made of this, uh, this sort of mud. Okay? So, so again, we say that, that these are fascinating to me. They're explicitly architectural, and, and they demonstrate this sort of incentive to, to make something, the satisfaction that comes with making, but they are, you know, technically speaking, not very impressive. Okay? Um, and, and moreover, in this case, we deal again with the notion of a kind of prefab uh, architectural pedimentals, because if you can't get into the workshop, and or you're, if you're too lazy, you can just go and you can buy one of these, or you can kind of compromise and you can buy a pediment going and kind of fill it with mud and put your, put your, your figures in here and, and, and so forth. So uh, there's a lot to be said about that. In, in any event, now I'm going to go to my, uh, my final sort of arc. And, and now that I've exhausted you, you get to the part that makes you think the hardest. So that is the most kind of interpretive section of the talk that will lead me to, to read a two minute conclusion. In any event, one obvious sort of question in looking at this material, do, do these architectural pedimentals qualify as crafts? Okay? And, and uh, I decided to, for the sake of time, largely forego this, this exercise, but I think you could cross-check these 10 criteria against these pedimentals, and, and, and interesting things emerge all over. The, the more general thing I would observe is uh, while it's Everyone is going to say that Alabrijas are Oaxaca's premier crafts. These, these are crafts, and nobody thinks these are crafts. But if we put them up against these criteria, I think I could make the case that architectural pedimentals are more suitably uh, described as crafts than, than our Alabrijas. In any event, the, the two things that, that are most important to me and which stand out most with the architectural pedimentals are are uh, criterion number two that, that the architectural pedimentals are uh, connected to kind of an, ob an obligatory life skill. This is not just playing around, we'll be back to that in a minute, but then even more, that architectural pedimentals serve as repositories of traditional cosmologies, mythologies, and religious ideas, okay? And so in that sense, uh, say, what, what is religious about them? What religious ideas, or what is religious about making architectural and to that I offer two, uh, two answers, okay? The first answer I put under the heading of obligatory reciprocity and exchange. Giving stuff to get stuff, okay? Uh, now, if, if you think uh, this book that I've looked at before, this one, or uh, directed your attention to before, is it, going to suggest, you know, what's really going on in, in Oaxaca religion is all about reciprocity. Many people talk about reciprocity and exchange. Invariably, their arguments go back to Marcel Mauss's sort of classic work on the gift and the form and the reason for exchange in archaic societies. But I find actually a more available and intriguing way to get at the issue uh, by looking at this book called Oaxaca Celebration, which is written by this woman, Mary Jane Gagner de Mendoza. And she's a Canadian, okay? And she uh, is a Canadian who goes to Teotitlan and marries this famous weaver, okay? So, so she has an interesting perspective because she's an outsider who becomes an insider. So she sees what's going on in Teotitlan, uh, but she's never really exactly part of it. So one of the things that really impresses her when she's looking at Teotitlan is that every time a family has a big event, a funeral or a, or, or, um, a wedding or something that's very expensive and they don't have the means to do it by themselves, people in the community step up and gift that person and give, give them what they need. They give them the, the, the chickens or the, or the turkeys or the tortillas or the chairs or the labor to, to get this done. And she's saying, you know, she never, she never observed this kind of gifting in, in Canada and her experience this sort of thing. But then she discovers, and to her consternation, on the other hand, all these people in Teotitlan who are giving things, and you find the similar accounts for almost all Oaxaca villages, they're keeping a tight, meticulous record about what they gave. <laughs> and they write this down. And they know, I gave 36 tortillas, I gave two chickens, and I gave you this, and I gave, and everything they gave, they're expecting to get back. And, they, and, they, and this is not exactly about kind of community spirited. This, this is about some other sort of exchange. But everybody in the community owes 
everybody else. And every, everything is sort of uh, connected. The social fabric is built on this sort of notion of obligatory reciprocity and exchange. Moreover, this is not where Gagner goes, but the Wahhabis then they extend that logic to their interaction with supernatural entities. So uh, I would say that for indigenous Wahhabians, human social relations, but also relations between humans and supernatural entities, deities, saints, crosses, virgins, depend upon the obligatory reciprocal exchange of material objects. Okay. And so if we just use that logic, we take that premise and see that, how that can help us understand what's happening at, at the Cross of Miracles and Kukila. Because at the Cross of Miracles, when people come, you don't come to the Cross of Miracles empty-handed. That's, that's, that makes as much sense as going to the store with no money or something. You've got to bring something, okay? you got to bring, you don't have to bring a good idea, you've got to bring some stuff. Okay? You've you got to bring, so even you have like a curandero that, that some people arrive at their curandero. She brings some sort of uh, material object and she guides her followers. They're going to go to the cave up above the, the Cross of Miracles and they make a pedimento, but a pedimento is giving something, but it's also a context in which to give more stuff. And then people go into the cave, they're not waiting in line to, 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 to just talk, they're waiting in line to deposit their stuff. They gotta put their stuff in there, and, and the other people who might go into the cave, they form a nice neat line and they head to the cross, and everybody in the line has got some stuff, okay? And they give their stuff to the cross, okay? Or they lay their stuff in the cross, or they rub their stuff in the cross, or they they pin their exposures on, on the cross. Uh, likewise, you see that anyone who goes to the, see the Virgin of uh, Ukila, it, it's just uh, it's not a it's not a rewarding encounter just to go to the sanctuary and, and interact with what is the, the, really the premier image. You have to have the exchange of material stuff. The real payoff comes when you go to El Pedimento, where again, you leave people standing in line, no one empty-handed, everybody ready to give some stuff, okay? To deposit their things. In, in that sense, then, architectural pedimentos are these kind of things that participate in this sort of logic of reciprocal exchange, or to go back to the material turn, this is a circumstance that demonstrates, uh, as the new materialists hope to, to uh, persuade us, that religion resides or reveals itself foremost in concrete practices and interactions with material objects. Okay? So if you look, you know, you stay in a little hotel in, in Bukila and they've got a they've got a an offering there, you, you can, or, or uh, an altar there, you can uh, pray, but in, in Hukila, you gotta have some stuff. You gotta, you gotta have a bag of bread. You can put something there. We don't just wanna hear what you have to say. Okay, the virgin needs some stuff. Okay? Now, now the, 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 the last, uh, the alternate answer to this question about what's religious about these uh, requires me to uh, try to mix clear something that's more complicated, but I'll, but I'll organize it under the rubric of paying on a permanent debt, honoring a covenant with the earth, okay? And I take this idea from this uh, uh, highly influential and, and deeply profound sort of ethnography by John Monaghan called The Covenants with the Earth and Rain that he built, that he wrote after spending three years with this community of Mishtekas called uh, Nuyo, okay? And, and this is uh, hard for me to summarize, but I'm reminded that, that Mircea Iliade uh, tells us how nearly all indigenous people have a recollection of some time in the, in the distant primordial past when people did not die. And then they have some other way of accounting for it, the origin of death, some story that talks about how, how death arose. In the case of the Nuyo, or the people that, that Monaghan works with, he says, the, you know, the Nuyo are, agriculturalists, and the Nuyo come to the realization that everything they have depends upon the earth. Everything comes from the earth, but they also come to the realization that agriculture is really hard on the earth. That agriculture itself kind of punishes the earth. All this sort of digging and scraping and, and, and uh, is, is uh, disruptive to the earth. So they describe some sort of primordial covenant, an agreement made between humans and the earth in the, in the time before time, wherein the earth and rain agreed to care for people, uh, and 
they will endure the pain that comes with architecture, or comes with agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a different pain in architecture, <laughs> a different in road construction. <laughs> but, but, but on one large condition, in return, people agree to provide the earth with regular offerings and to die, at which point their bodies will return to the earth. So this is kind of a quirky story, but in another way, this is, this is a poignant reflection of a Oaxacan way of thinking about the transience and dependency of the human condition. That their, their, their condition depends upon the earth, and, and, you, and it doesn't last forever. Everyone will die. Okay? And, and Monaghan then is going to go and look at some kind of pre-Columbian sources that I'll go over quickly. But just to suggest that this is an idea with, with deep historical depth, uh, depth so that um, there were, uh, in these pre-Columbian codices, uh, accounts in which people negotiate with the gods and then they give offerings which, which eventuate in successful uh, agriculture and so forth. So this notion of a covenant with earth in which in exchange for the use and fecundity of the earth, the earth is owed a continuous repayment of offerings, including the only offering that really is sufficiently suitable for, for the value that architecture provides is the offering of human bodies. So when people die, they go back to the earth, okay? Uh, now that, that is, is, a, is a deep pre-Columbian idea, but I'm fascinated by the way in which the Nuyo also bring to bear that sort of logic in their understanding of road construction and traffic fatalities. This could seem like kind of a stretch, but I'm getting toward the end here. Um, that, that in Oaxaca, because you have all of these mountains, building roads is a big deal. It's, it's very difficult. But building roads like agriculture is very painful to, to the earth. And so the New York have come to realize that every road construction project uh, costs many lives. People die building roads. Moreover, they realize that highways, and, and another uh, way in which Oaxaca is, is high on the list, is traffic fatalities. In, in this sort of mountain roads and bad cars and, and Reckless sort of driving. So, so another thing that has been tremendously fascinating to me is to pay attention to these hundreds of uh, roadside memorials, which, which is another venue, I think, in which we're going to set something I would describe as architectural pedimentos, because uh, a roadside memorials usually have a cross, but then some other little house-like sort of thing. A lot of them have a, a date and a name, and you know who died there, and and, and so forth, and some of them are elaborate and so forth, but I see these, a lot of these are explicitly architectural. That, that, you know, I have to imagine the, the sort of uh, satisfaction some family gets to go out on the highway and make something uh, that, that is working, but the things they make, you know, sometimes they're, they're not very elaborate. It's not the, it's not the, the, the skill that, that accounts for these. But what I think is going on with these things, then, among others, of things is that highway fatalities via these making these uh, roadside memorials and pedimentos transforms what we might say when a family is killed on a curb in the road, this is a senseless tragedy. They reinterpret this is not a senseless tragedy. This is a responsible and obligatory payment on a debt that never ends. They're, they're paying the earth back. Okay? Uh, and, and in that sense it's, it's the exchange for the fecundity that the that the earth began. So there's more to say about that, but I'm going to then, uh, as, as promised, just give you a two minute conclusion and, and uh, to make sure to stick to that, I, I, I wrote this part and I'll, I'll read it. Okay? Finally, then, I summarize and reiterate with respect to the rewards and logic of architectural pedimentals, humble little constructions that. Uh, that one may initially find doubly unimpressive. First in their simplistic conception and even more in their simplistic slapdash execution. These pedimentos can seem, especially to a room full of architects, as very unsophisticated version of what James Fraser called sympathetic magic, wherein one gives a crude model house in hopes of getting a bigger and better resident, gives a plastic chicken in hopes of getting a real chicken, a model truck in hopes of getting a new and better truck, and so forth. And indeed, many pilgrims to, at the Cross of America explain their motives, at least to an outsider like me, in that simplistic and seemingly highly self-interested way. But I want to argue that there is more at issue here than the sympathetic magic notion of light produces light. Uh, that architectural pedimentals 
irrespective of their facile edu execution, can indeed teach us something about the significant interaction between practice, craft, materials, and making. With respect to the question of whether these architectural uh, pedimentals are craft, on that question I see to your higher wisdom and judgment. On that question, your opinion is, I think, at least as reliable as mine. But on the second question, how is pedimental making religious? I have some stronger, still tentative opinions. And in that regard, of the 10 criteria I laid out, I find two of them to be especially salient in the case of uh, architectural pedimentals. Number two, because I want to stress that pedimental making, uh, while it may seem like a kind of fun and jovial activity, is actually a serious obligatory undertaking. Making these little stone models is not just playtime. It's an exercise in a serious, mandatory, important life skill. This is an exercise in what Jonathan Smith would term ritual labor, which enables Oaxacans to maintain healthy relationships both with other people and with supernatural agents, the gods, saints, virgins, crosses that inhabit their world. And even more importantly, number seven, because I want to stress that pedimental making is anything but frivolous and newfangled. To the contrary, this is a ritual activity with roots that reach deep back into the pre-Columbian past, and which therefore acts as a repository uh, of many traditional cosmological, mythological, and religious conceptions. And of the many traditional cosmological and religious conceptions that are, that are most apparent in pedimental making, I've highlighted two. To summarize, under the rubric of what I call uh, obligatory reciprocity in the exchange, giving stuff to get stuff, I would insist that architectural pedimentals are not simply self-interested petitions for bigger and better houses. To the contrary, architectural pedimentals exemplify the sort of obligatory reciprocity in exchange of material objects that bind together all social and supernatural relationships in this context. Second, under the rubric of what I described permanent death, honoring a covenant with earth, I find an explanation for why these pedimentals seem so poorly executed, slapdash little constructions that fall apart and dissolve almost as soon as they are made. These architectural pedimentals are, I think, deliberately built to dissolve rather than to last. Uh, especially apparent in the mud-made pedimentals at Kukila, which are made from precisely the same cerro pedimental clay dirt as the hillside on which they are deposited, these, are pediment these pedimentals are the opposite of rock-hard tombstones that are designed to endure through time. Deliberately built to dissolve rather than to last, made from the earth and then immediately returned to the earth, architectural pedimentals are a perfect metaphor for a human life that does not last. And in that sense, architectural pedimentals are poignant, um, poignant material expressions of the transience and dependency of the human condition. Indeed, then, I end as I began with, uh, by noting that these humble, shabby little constructions demonstrate something very profound about the interaction between practice, craft, materials, and making. Thanks for your attention. But then, 
when I started looking at it, I'm, I'm finding lots of stuff, including, you know, there's, there's a village with my students I go to, that, you know, I, I go to Ixtlan, you know, you know, and he doesn't say what Ixtlan is. I, I think that, uh, that Castaneda's insights are much more informed by what goes on in Oaxaca than is generally appreciated. So, yeah, that's, it's, it's hard for me to get a little more specific. Well, maybe over some church. Yes. Sure. I had a question. Yeah. I have two. <clears throat> I'm sure you've walked through cemeteries in Mexico. Yes, every chance I get. Uh, they're filled with the same thing. Architectural structures that are usually filled with offerings. You see them in the same light? Well, it's it's a complicated question is, to, especially because I got so interested in these roadside memorials, you know, and if you think about what, what does a roadside memorial have to do, after that person's killed on the highway, then they take them and put them in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. So the bodies are not at the roadside. So, you know, Oaxaca is, a, is again, this is another, a perfect example of what I said in terms of commodifying crafts and uh, and celebrating them and selling out because Oaxaca has turned the, the Day of the Dead into a, a huge sort of tourist event. And, and But when you see what's going on in cemeteries, I, I think that, because the bodies are there, okay? And so you t they're interacting with the dead in a certain way. When, at these roadside memorials, the body's not there. There's, some, there's something else going on. The event is there. Yeah, and, but you know, these the two, I, I am so impressed with the attention they get. You know, I mean, you can find in a, in a kind of an obscure highway, there's no good place to pull off. Finally, you get off and you go to this roadside memorial and you see it's receiving a lot of attention. That, that, there, that there are fresh flowers there, or there's new candles, or something has happened. So I, I, I'm working that out. But I think what's going on in cemeteries is, is something different than what's going on at those uh, roadside things. Now, have you noticed in North America, particularly in rural communities, at least the communities that I uh, dwell in and travel through, the appearance of roadside memorials has been pretty common in yeah. the last 10, 15 years, yeah. to the point where they're prevalent, and largely by you know rural whites. I mean, it's not right. a function of this kind of population yeah. you know, living in those communities. Well, this is this is. Uh, a complexity that I find in all of this material, because I think I think there's always a temptation to to let's make sense of these things. Why why would I make a roadside memorial? Why would I make an architectural memorial? And you say, well, I want to make a roadside memorial to to respect my ancestor or to give my children a chance to to visit their brother or so, or something like that. I, I what what I'm going for and what really fascinates me is something more specifically Oaxaca. Which is, which is some more culturally distinctive way, which I th I'm suggesting you could find in this thing about a covenant with the earth, so, so that the, there, uh, you know, the roadside memorials could be kind of firing on many levels in terms of just sort of remembering and honoring people. But I, I think there's something at work there that's not at work when we see those. I, I saw them today actually uh, approaching here. Some of this, uh, a, a cross and a flag, and, but not also not a uh, not anything architectural, not, not any little house that was built. So uh, not a very good answer. But, but I'm 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 always you know this is a broader sort of point. But uh, I love Mexico. I love Oaxaca. And what I always am most excited about is the difference. You know, I mean, when you can go find so many ways, people are the same. But you say they're. they're Oh, they're they're thinking about this in a different way. They're doing this in a different way. They're they're so, so in that way, I would not want to trust my own sort of gut sense about what's valuable about a roadside more. I have a question. Do you know if they have any plans on Texas, South um, in South Central Texas, to do this because there are a lot of these kind of memorials in the world? Yeah. In that area. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, 
Again, I think so, but I think a lot of different things are going on. I didn't have time really to get into this when I when I talk about uh, <coughs> prefab prefab pedimentos, but but I'm first excited by the fact that alongside the road, all of these roadside memorials are seem completely handmade. They seem completely homespun, like individual and kind of ragged and. But then I notice, because I, I go to the cemetery, but I go to I go to you know where they're selling mortuary stuff too. I was all the dead things are interesting to me, and I see that there's so many uh, roadside memorials that you can begin you can buy prefab roadside memorials now too. They, they have so there there is a a kind of conventionalization of this, but uh, I I, th I don't think even that Oaxaca is going to be quite like the rest of Mexico, let alone like... Yeah. Well, definitely they influence the, the practice, you know, that, that you do this. Whether it has it carries the same kind of significance or, or different valences, I don't know. But yeah, definitely the... the uh, and, and I don't see any... I don't I don't look at this over time, but... But I don't have any sense that that practice is flagging. I said it's just as strong as ever. Yes. I wonder if you'd give any thought to um, the way in which you talk about the attention that these roadside ones have, have received. Does that seem to perhaps contradict the notion that they're intended to be temporary and kind of go back to the earth? And then it makes me wonder if flowers or if there are certain elements of attention that are given, but does the architecture receive the attention? Is an element that's a construction? Yeah. Get repaired, get stuff or anything? Or? Yeah. No, there's a lot of contradictions, and I, and I think that that's a, that's a good one because they're not they they don't fit that criterion of dissolving. That they're they're permanent, and a lot of times the structure the structural part seems just to be a container that is a place to put the stuff. Okay. But 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 you do get the, the first of the two notions. Then instead of people are just going to go there and pray, they're going to go there and leave some stuff. You got to put, you got to put material things need to be a, a component of this emotion yeah. going. On. But yeah, yeah. Well, just as a comment on the you said that when you dream of a house, you're dreaming of yourself, your personality. So when you're doing the stuff in the house, it's kind of like pushing the vision or the dream. Yeah, right. Well, I, I like that, you know, when I say they're explicitly architectural, you know, they're explicitly domestic, too. You see, it, it, and to me, I think you could want a lot of architects could be, could be moved and inspired by the notion that you want a better life, you know what you need? You need a better built domestic environment. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the best metaphor for a better life or something, or at least that's kind of what they're going for. What, what they seem to be expressing. You know. Someone should write a book about the ontology of home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess I'm not sure the there's another person. No, I'm, I'm just uh, alluding to Tom Berry who has a book on the. He's not here yet. We can't be fun of him. The uh, <laughs> ontology of home, though, yeah, it, it speaks to this. <laughs> Two thoughts. Uh, one, do you think that there's any communal memory of a time centuries ago when everyone's value as a human being is related to building a home of mine? When the, the making of that was how they found identity and place in the community. And if any of that kind of communal memory makes pedimentos uh, of particular value. The other thought, uh, and this goes to the fact that there was a, a, a Zapotec laborer living here in Dirao this last summer, uh, and I spent quite a bit of time with him, and he was the hardest worker I'd ever seen, and I said, well, where does this work, work ethic come from? And he said, that's who we are in my book. Yeah, right. We work really hard. That's how we value. Yeah. We make things because there was nothing else to do. Yeah. And idle hands are the devil's work time. Yeah. I mean, right. We, 
make things. We work hard. That's where we get our value. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. struggling with those. With those well, two, to, to connect those two those, to connect those two things. But you know, I mean, my my research theme that I'm really pursuing in Oaxaca focuses on Monte Alvarado. So, so my first idea when I started to go to all these communitarian museums, I'm going to see how every communitarian museum represents Monte Alban. And this will be, and as soon as I went started going to it, they don't represent Monte Alban at all. They don't care about that. They care about local stuff. They, they want to talk about what's, what's local. So in terms of their sort of, every village in Oaxaca has something they used to call like the old city, the ruins that are just up the hillside from that. And those are the, those are the heritage of constants. So it's a building of buildings. Yeah, but not but not not the Monte Alban right. is sort of is sort of removed. <clears throat> but but I hope that this came through because it's not connected to architectural pedimental so much. But that that was uh, fascinating and moving to me to see in those communitarian museums the, the way the fullness with which people said their personhood is connected with what they make. Who, who are you? We are makers of palm we, we are, th this is our, uh, and w which goes, you know, there's something that feels at, at points kind of petty about these sort of proprietary claims to, to own a craft. You know, that's our design. You can't, you can't replicate our design. This, no, that's, that's, that's us. You know, that, that, that design is, is, is as a kind of integral connection to how we think of ourselves. So for you to, to be borrowing that is diminishing us in, in, in some way. So I think there's, you know, on, on this, the second point, I mean, I think that, and, and you could probably, if you think about the, the, the new materialists, that, that people in those communitarian museums are not, are, they're not very articulate philosophers, you know, that they're talking about what they do, what they make, not sort of abstractions, they're talking about the, the more concrete uh, physicality, which is which is you know, with which their identity is embedded. So, so I, I don't know. I mean, your your questions are uh, right in the zone where I'm sort of thinking about what to do, where to go. So, I'm thinking that what feeds the spirit, in part, is not the product. Yeah, yes, sure, sure. And, that's, and I think you could get that from the pedimentos too, right? They're making the, the end product is, is disposable. And that, in that way, you know, so I find some analogies with something like, uh, you know, Navajo sand painting or something, you know, which is all about the, the, the process, or, or Tibetan mandalas that people make, and then, and then, you know, just the willingness to, you know, I think most of us have probably observed that. And it, that's, it's kind of painful for me to see that script. But, but that, that's because you're not getting it. It's, it's not the end product that matters. It's the it's the making that where the where the value lies in the, in the making. Like you just said, you guys are just saying we wanted to do sand castles. I mean, we as kids or whatever, we would build sand castles and we just kind of watch the waves wash them away. Right. It's right. The process of making and, and you know getting. Yeah. Done. So what? Why are you making? <laughs> Why, why are we making sand if, if, Yeah, you, if you're aware of it. Um, as, I mean, as a kid, it was just the wonder of creating. Yeah. Uh -huh. The joy. Right. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I have two short questions, kind of tagging on the previous comment here. So I, I, this is what I'm reading from the lecture, and I really, really appreciate it. So this idea of offering an idea so that can be worship or prayer, offering an object, which you're showing us here with the pedimento, but this idea that the object, its value, is coming from you know, the effort making. So I'm wondering, is there this layer of offering your energy, right? And if there's like this kind of the energy of making, right? And that effort, that is your act of worship, is the energy of making. And then that gets dissolved and re-energized and come back in the world. Yeah. And, and I mean that in a very kind of yeah. um, like tactile way. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious about that. And if um, these ready-made ones that don't have the energy right. put into them by the people, is there any kind of critique at all by the users of this 
Because I know we critique each other, not architects, yeah. but every day we can critique each other about all kinds yeah. of things. Um, do they, is there a critique at all of, yeah. oh, you made this, you didn't make this, or this is special? Um, so that's a question. Yeah. My other question, which is really short, but uh, it's been nagging me for a lot of this lecture, is you were saying uh, early part in the lecture that people keep very careful track of what they gift each other, yeah. the tortillas and everything. Yeah. Do they do that with the gods? Do they do that with their offerings? Do they keep careful track of everything they offer? I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. And if they, well, do, if the, they do, what does that mean? And if they don't, what does that mean? Yeah, not in the same, because these are books. These are written books that yeah. you get, you know, it's, I don't, I no, 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 I'm asking what you're Yeah, so, so I'm not aware that there's, a, that there's a parallel book yeah. for <laughs> guys. But, but it is, but, the, but I'm inclined to think the logic is the same. Yeah. But, I mean, this is, this is a complicated yeah. sort of issue because when I first look at Monaghan's work and I'm writing to, I, I don't like, this is, this is like a error number one in comparative religion 101, we call this a covenant. Covenant is kind of a Jewish specific sort of notion that the, that doesn't even make it doesn't make sense in Islam exactly. You know that you can kind of hold hold God accountable for the uh, you know. And so I first thought this this the notion of covenant brings way too much baggage into it, mm -hmm. kind of. A, but then the more I work with it, I think no, it, it it makes it makes a lot of sense. So in the logic of covenant, you get that sort of mutual obligation. And in that sense, God's, God's have an obligation to, yeah, like that, so you, you give, you give you them, that. You've, you've, you've encumbered them with an obligation. Exactly, so you may not be exactly keeping tally in the book somewhere, but you're kind of front paying, front loaded. Yeah, okay. right. Okay, but and on your, on your other point, you know, because I, I think your, your sense is like mine, you know, and, I, and when I go to the Cross of Miracles, I think I've spent four or five New Year's Eve's there now, and that family's good friends, and I, I've never seen I brought a gringo here. I'm disappointed. I'm not gonna tell you. But that's the only other one I saw. I mean, there, this, this is not a tourist place. So, so, so we just sort of hang around and talk to people. And I and I'm looking for this. Like, is this is this the cheap? This is the cheap way out. You're buying a pedimento. Or this is the, you know, or, or sometimes, you know, I, I talk to the vendors. They well, so what's a big seller here? People want babies. Or do people really want airplanes? Or they are they want a trip? Or what? Or the you know, and, and what I realized was, you know, they don't want levity about this. This is, mm. this is, not, a, this is not funny, mm. you know. In the way to me, oh, you're going to give a little plastic baby my first, I'm, I'm thinking that this is kind of ironic thing that they're mm. thinking. Mm. And, and in my conversations, I, I'm surprised to realize, no, there's, there's no irony there, nor is there any sense that I've sort of shortcutted the practice by buying a pedimento instead of mm. making one. That that's it. That that's a that's a low route or something. Okay. So which it kind of seems obvious to me, but but it it's not that's that's not cheating or. I'm just concerned because with the plastic objects, I mean, just following your logic, they don't dissolve, right? Whereas the handmade ones that have all that energy, yeah. they do. So I'm just curious if there was it. Well, and that's what you get to you know, when you know the family and what I showed at Bukila, you know. At Bukila, I was uh, impressed to find this, this, this room that was filled with all the, all the pentamentos that they're just shoveling and throwing in there, you know, because uh, every, everything I showed you had, had been there from the last month. There's so many people coming, you've got you to gotta replace this. So, so at the Cross of Miracles, you know, they just go, you know, the family just clean it up and mm -hmm. throw it out. Or, so, uh, so, so the plastic ones don't dissolve, but but they're gone. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's uh, disconcerting to me, but uh, not seeming to them. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay well, I, I, as I said, I'll end as I started because I, I feel like I was presented with a gift to. To, to work and think through this. So, so thank you very much for. Okay.